Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Can we stand up for this morning's worship? And I think we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you. Lord, we uh, lift your name up today. Lord, help us to be reflective uh, of this holy week that we're entering into. Uh, Father, that you would be in our thoughts uh, throughout this week. And Father, I just pray that this morning that you would be lifted up and glorified here in the midst of your people. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you all got palms, so we're going to want to see them waving, right? <coughs>
may be seated as we prepare for this morning's offering. so grateful and thankful that we could be here this morning, still free, Lord, to worship you. And Lord, we just uh, just pray that you receive all glory and all honor. And Father, we just ask you to bless this offering that we give to you as part of our worship to you, Lord. That you would bless it and use it to your purposes. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mark and his family are gallivanting around the, the U.S. somewhere, uh, we're, uh, but uh, we are glad that everyone's here this morning uh, and just want to welcome you, say welcome, say welcome to all our guests here this morning and uh, just have a few announcements to go over. First of all, on Friday is our Seder dinner or Passover dinner. It's at the fairgrounds at 6.30. Uh, we want to thank everyone who signed up. If you're going to bring food, please have it there 15 minutes early so we can get it all set up. And you can still sign up if you haven't. Contact Pastor Pat and he will uh, make sure that you can get set, signed up. So it's going to be a great time of fellowship and praising our Lord during that time. Next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we will be having two services, one at 8.15 and the second one at 11. So invite your friends, your neighbors, even your not friends. Just We want to fill the place up. And then there is breakfast at 9.30. So between the two services is breakfast. And we ask that you... If you're bringing food for breakfast, bring it in through the kitchen. Also, this Sunday is Communion Sunday. It's open communion available for all those who believe. So please uh, uh, remember this time and set your hearts and get them ready for communion. We also have a special time that we need to be in prayer this morning. We ask that the Whitney family come on up and explain what's going on with them and their baby and uh, how we can pray for them and help them during this time. So please come on up. Well, 
hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zach. This is my wife, Maggie, and our four kids, Max and Natalie and Marigold and Landon. And we are the Whitleys, and we are relatively new here. We just started coming here this year, and um, it's been really awesome being a part of the church. Um, we found out earlier this year that uh, we were pregnant with number five. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't we cry. <laughs> Um, our fifth baby is named Josiah Solomon Whitley, and uh, we're about 24 weeks today. Um, we found out that Josiah has spina bifida. So uh, for those of you who don't know, spina bifida means like an opening in the spine that usually causes paralysis, among other things. Um, so we've been... <laughs> I think God put us here at the time that he did on on purpose, uh, because we've been part of this, this church family through this process of finding out about all this, learning about all this, and, um, and getting ready to have a uh, prenatal surgery. Uh, so we are actually moving to Ann Arbor this week. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have surgery on Maggie and on Josiah on April 11th at Ann Arbor. <laughs> Uh, in, at U of M Hospital, at uh, Mott Children's Hospital, and, um, uh, and that's going to repair the opening in his spine to hopefully improve uh, the effects of spina bifida a little bit, and, um, and so once we have that surgery, we have to stay close to the hospital. We can't, Maggie can't be more than 15, 20 minutes from the hospital at all times, uh, so we're moving uh, just for a few months, and um, we have been very blessed by the members of this church and the members of our past churches and things that um, we've been, we've had a lot of financial gifts and prayer gifts and um, it has really been a time in our lives for us to grow closer to God and, um, and so we are kind of going on an adventure for a couple months and we're going to see what God does. So um, I wanted to share a verse if I could. This is from Habakkuk 3, verses 17 through 19. Um, for those of you who haven't read Habakkuk recently, it's, he's a prophet, and he's talking about all the bad things that are going to happen to Israel because of their lack of faith. But at the end, uh, there's one short section at the very end of the book. Um, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. That's something that God has really put on our hearts through this process, so. We'd love it if you could pray for us before we go. My family has a lot of experience being at my hospital. They do miracles there, but God's the one who does the miracles. So uh, let's be in great prayer for them, uh, especially over these next couple weeks um, and over the next few months. And God can heal in his own special way uh, through miracles, through surgeries, and through the hearts of people. So uh, let's, uh, let's pray for them right now. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for who you are. Lord, we thank you and praise, praise you, Lord, how we can say, Hosanna, blessed be our King, Lord, and uh, we praise you for how you've changed our hearts and our lives, Lord, and we pray now that you can be with the Whitney family as they uh, get ready for this adventure that you have called them to, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray for Josiah and, and the surgery that you have planned for them, Lord, we we pray for a miracle that the surgery won't even be necessary, Lord, but 
If it is, Lord, we pray that you be with the hands of all those who are serving Josiah and, and their family, Lord. Lord, we pray for them during this time that they can grow closer to you and be a witness for you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you uh, be with the church family. Just show us how we can serve this family in their time of need, that we can be a grace to them through you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I know it's Palm Sunday, and we're being uplifting and joyful, but when one of our brothers and sisters is bearing a burden, we bear that with them, whether it's Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. Or whatever it is, we're with you guys. So you better keep us updated on how things go. Amen. And they're going to give us their new address down there, and we're all going to send them enjoyable, uplifting cards and snacks and treats and everything. So <laughs> make, sure, make sure you get the address to us ASAP. Alrighty, today I want to chat with you guys in Pastor Mark's absence about the rich young ruler. Today's Palm Sunday. Uh, this is a day where we really begin to, well, we do it every day, but especially today we reflect on the final chapter of Jesus' life. The chapter begins with Jesus entering Jerusalem. This is the city that God chose to put his name. He comes in on the back of a donkey, and it was a, a scene that confirmed through the praises of the people whether they realized it at the time or not. Can you turn me down a little bit? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Kiddos, we got to get you out of here. We did this last week, too. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll give you a minute here. All right, five and under can head downstairs. Thank you, guys. We'll get through it in a second. Thank you, guys, for being patient with me. I thought they were trying to mess with me in the back. <laughs> Throw me off my game. All right, that day on Palm Sunday, through the praises of the people, they may not have realized it at the time, but they were confirming that Jesus was the Messiah who had come in the name of the Lord. That's why we sing Hosanna. The ministry of Christ was reaching its culmination. In the past, interestingly enough, Jesus had told his disciples and some of those that he had healed to keep things silent, to keep things on the down low. In Matthew 12, 16, he said he ordered them not to make him known. Matthew 16, 20, he said he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. These are interesting passages. Now Jesus is entering Jerusalem, embracing public worship. And though things may not have been what they seemed, the Jews of Jerusalem rightly believed the prophesy of Zechariah 9, 9, and it had become a reality. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, unfortunately, this excitement that these people had as Christ entered the city was not founded on an on a anticipation that the ultimate redemption of their souls had come, but rather that their messianic military deliverer had arrived, and their joy was misplaced. This discrepancy becomes clear when over the following days, Jesus fails to live up to these military expectations, and the shouts go from Hosanna to crucify him. They shout for his execution. Now those days in Jerusalem, they were not the only people in scripture who have looked for something from Christ that was not what they truly needed, and we have done it too. We have gone to him for things that were not what we truly needed. As Jesus was traveling between Capernaum and Jerusalem, perhaps just days before he entered on Palm Sunday, Jesus encounters a young man who runs up to him and drops to his knees, and that encounter is what we're going to talk about today. You and I have gone to Jesus with misguided desires as well, and it's always a time where Jesus shows us great mercy, just like a good father would with their son or daughter coming to them, with a sort of a genuine heart but misguided desires. He's patient. He works with us. But also, first encounters with Jesus are also filled with unexpected responses from him and different truths that he speaks that can provoke a variety of emotions. And that's what we see today. In Mark 10, is where we'll be, we see an all-too-common case of human expectations meeting the reality of Jesus Christ. And this is in the form of a young man with a lot of money. 
So we're going to read Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So Jesus is approached by this young man. He's rich. And though the conversation does not end on the most positive note, as we'll see here soon, I believe this young man is really genuine in approach. You see, the way it ends is kind of negative, as we'll get to, but I don't doubt this man's genuineness. And the reasons for that is it says he came to Jesus on the way. Now, Jesus, as he was heading over to Jerusalem, between Capernaum and Jerusalem, I would say he was likely flanked by many followers, by crowds. And unlike Nicodemus, who wanted to hide in the cover of night and go talk to Jesus, this young man runs up to him on the way. I believe he's genuine because he literally runs to Jesus. I believe he's genuine because he kneels at his feet. I believe he's genuine because he addresses him in quite a reverent way that stood apart from the way they would have addressed other teachers. He calls him good teacher. And I believe his question is very valid and a question that more people should be asking today, which is, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do? I think most people in the world don't feel like asking that question. They would think it's a silly question. They might say, why do you even believe in eternal life? Once you die, it's lights out. We cease to exist. Don't you know that? You're being a little superstitious there. You're a religious person. I think if someone is open to the idea of, of a religious belief, they would probably say, well, what do you mean? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? I have clearly done enough to have it right now. Why shouldn't I have eternal life as we speak? If eternal life means heaven and, and eternal damnation means hell, obviously I'll be going to heaven. What do you mean? I, I should be on the right side of history here. What could I possibly have done that would make me unworthy of eternal life? This is the common mainstream thought in the minds of people open to the idea of, of, of an afterlife anyway, is what could I have possibly done to, to, to not go to be with God someday? But this man, as he approaches Jesus, does seem to have an authentic desire to know if he's in or not. Before we get to Jesus' answer, though, I want to talk about the, the title that is used with Jesus uh, as the young man addresses him. He calls him good teacher. And what does Jesus say? Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. And it's an interesting response, because if you don't dive too deep into it, you'd say, is Jesus saying that he's not God? Is that what Jesus is saying? So you and I maybe don't want people to call us by titles or attributes that only belong to God. But given as Christians, we commit to the deity of Christ. We have to. Jesus must be saying something else here. Jesus called himself the great I am. He called himself the way, the truth, and the life. He said there's no other way to God except through him. Of course Jesus can call himself good. Of course he can. He is good. So I think Jesus is doing two things in asking this question. I think first he's inviting this young man to truly reflect on what he just said. Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know what it really means when you're calling me a good teacher? Because only God is good. If you're going to address me as good teacher, it's time to maybe think for a second on what this encounter truly is. And I think he's showing the man uh, his potential misunderstanding of what it means to be good as we start to dig into this young man's life. Nevertheless, the man asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And let's read verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I find this as another interesting response from Jesus, because now he's going into a bunch of works. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, you know all the things you need to do to inherit eternal life. And I find it very interesting. Doing things, I have to do things to go to heaven. I was raised in a good, good faith-based church that I don't need to do anything. In fact, I can't do anything to get into heaven. So what is this all about? Is Jesus sending mixed messages to us about salvation by grace through faith? And when I first started reading this story as a younger Christian, and I was, it was pounded into my brain to you people here, in, by you people here at this church, um, that you cannot do anything to be saved. And when I would read this story, he says, how am I saved? And Jesus said, do, you know the commandments. I thought, well, what is he trying to do here? 
I think if Jesus were to ask this question today, his response maybe would sound like, if we're comparing some of the commands of the Old Testament versus some of the things we're told to do in the New Covenant, I think he would say something like, you know what I've commanded? Give generously. Don't forsake fellowshipping with people. Take communion. Get baptized. You know, these are all the commands that we, that we try to follow here as New Testament Christians. And we would all wonder if this guy was trying to change the way that people are saved. If somebody, if I asked Pastor Mark here a while ago, how do I get saved? And he said, well, you need to get baptized. You need to start taking communion. You need to make sure you're coming to church on time. I would say, I don't know about this. It sounds a little off. We need to remember that in specific encounters between Jesus Christ and flawed individuals, he is seeing deep into their hearts in a way that they can't see and a way that we can't always see. So he's speaking with this man in terms that he needs to hear. And as we dig deeper, we'll continue to uncover why Jesus is answering him the way that he is. In response to this question, Jesus is not making a to-do list of moral obligations for the man to check off after this conversation so he can go get saved. But I think rather he's exposing to the man that thing that is holding him from full commitment to God. Now, it is possible, I think, through a certain interpretation of this, that this man did really keep these commandments very well since his youth. Paul in Philippians 3, 6 even said that he was blameless in keeping the law. So I don't see this man as necessarily trying to prove to Jesus that he's righteous, trying to tell him that he's got it all figured out. But he was actually pretty confident in himself that he had lived a decently obedient life according to the law of Moses. He thinks he had done a pretty good job. But if you remember Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount gave us the real meaning of the law, that it goes to your heart, not just to your actions. You can have a heart filled with adultery even if you've never committed adultery, and you can have a heart filled with murder even if you've never murdered somebody. And you can have a heart that steals even if you've never stolen because God is looking at your heart. So Jesus says to him, you want eternal life? You know what to do. You need to keep the commandments. The man says, I've been keeping these since I was a kid, since I was a child. And let's look at Jesus' response to that one. Verses 21 and 22. Just start coming around correctly. Verses 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you, and, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Very sad. Not everyone in the Gospels that encounters Jesus was given a direct invite to follow him on the spot. This is, this is pretty unique. Obviously, the 12 disciples were given it. But as far as a one-on-one -on -one request, invitation to follow me, not everybody got that. Now, many do. But some were actually commanded not to follow him, and physically follow him around the area. If you remember when Jesus went to the Gadarenes to, to heal that man with a legion of demons, he heals him, the, the demons go out, they go into the pigs, the people come out, they're angry with Jesus that he ruined their livelihood, and the man is completely changed, he's transformed, so people are wondering, this guy must be some sort of sorcerer, we need to get him out of here immediately. And what does the man do? He says, it comes, it says he came to Jesus and begged him that he could go with him. And Jesus said, no, you need to go back to your city, back to your family, and tell them all of the wonderful things that God has done for you. So even this man asked Jesus, can I please come with you? You just saved my life, man. Can I please come? And Jesus said, no. But this man, the rich young ruler, he's actually given a direct invitation to walk with Jesus along the way. And Jesus uh, gave him the opportunity, but he didn't follow Many people have been called to follow Jesus through the scriptures and up to today, and we give different excuses as for why we're not able to. If you remember in the scriptures, people were invited to follow me, and someone said, I need to go bury my father first. I need to go live the rest of my life once my dad passes away. Then I can bury him, and I'll catch up with you in 20 or 30 years. How does that sound? Other people said, I need to go say farewell to those people at my house. These might sound like decent excuses, but they're not. They're cop-outs. In the parable of the great banquet, the host, who is God, invites all of the guests, and they, one by one, begin to make excuses for why they can't make it. One says, I just bought a field. Another says, I just bought some oxen. And the third says, I just got married. All these things are too important. I need to go take care of the animals in my field. I need to go tend to my marriage. I cannot come. 
Like I said, these might seem like decent excuses, but the heart of these passages is meant to reveal that the invitation from Christ to set everything aside and follow him is a call that no excuse in your life will ever be able to match. The demand is to lay it all aside to follow Jesus. And if many of you have been born again here today, you can think of how simple that was. When Jesus just pricked your heart, dove deep into your heart, just totally remade who you are, and everything outside of Christ became so trivial and meaningless in that moment that it was so simple to set aside because Jesus had done a work in your heart. It's not the same for this man. Now, these requests from Christ don't necessarily make anything less daunting every time because some people are very attached to the cares of this world. And this call from Jesus was for this man to sell everything he had and to give it to the poor. That can be pretty daunting if you love money. This was not a universal call from God given to anybody. This is not a message from Jesus that if you have a brand new iPad at home and you haven't sold it and given it to the poor, then you're in sin. You can keep your iPad. It's okay. You don't need to sell everything you have. But this is a statement, remember, from Jesus to this man personally. Even though he may be a decent person according to the law, his character lacked one thing, and he loved his money more than he was willing to love Jesus. So he went away sad. And it's a really sad story when you think about it. A man who quite possibly really wanted to get close to Christ and find God and find eternal life, let go of the opportunity because he had a lot of money. And it's different with each of us today, but we can all relate. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11 says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a stare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. That makes loving money sound pretty scary. And this passage is very interesting because it, it doesn't talk about something that seems so outrightly sinful that it would plunge your life into ruin and destruction, but it literally will. And there's more gain in godliness and contentment than in wealth. Desiring to be rich can plunge your life into ruin and destruction. And loving money has and will lead people away from Jesus. And maybe you can think about some people that you've encountered in your Christian life that have left Christ because money became too important. That was the thing that they wanted to pursue, and you cannot pursue both. You cannot love God and money. It's clear. And I want to make a couple contrasts that show how sad this story is compared to how wonderful it could have been compared to how other people have reacted to Christ in the past. And I think these can show us where our hearts might just be today as well. So if you look at verse uh, Luke 19, 8, this is what this says. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now you may not know this, but the Torah and Leviticus would have only required Zacchaeus to pay back what he had stole plus one-fifth. So to make it easy for all of us, if he stole $100, he needed to pay back. 120, there we go, very nice. Zacchaeus wanted to pay $400 back. That's pretty good, especially since I think he probably stole more than $100 from people. Verse in Acts chapter 2, 41 through 45. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all, who, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. An entire culture, an entire society of people starting to come to Christ Everything they owned, at least most of the things they owned, maybe not everything, most of the things they owned became immediately expendable. 
their televisions, their Xboxes, their, uh, let's see, what else do you guys love? <laughs> what else? The fishing boats. Their shoes? I don't know. It looks pretty dirty out there. They may have wanted their shoes. They do go on your feet, you know. Um, everything they owned, most things they owned, became expendable for the cause of the church. Not for the rich young ruler. He loved all of it too much. Acts 19, 18 and 19. Also, many of those who now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who have practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. This is in Ephesus, where everybody was doing magic arts, and there were sorcerers and witches. And Paul and, and James, they come in, and they, they, everybody starts getting saved, and everybody begins immediately selling all of the sinful stuff. They're pouring the booze out. They're burning everything. They're burning their books. And it goes to 50,000 pieces of silver. They didn't say, maybe we could sell these magic books to the sorcerer down the street who hasn't been saved yet, and maybe he could, he could use them later. No, 50,000 pieces of silver were burned in the street, is what you could say. And when you start to convert that, convert that amount to what we understand today, you easily start to climb into the millions of dollars range. And that shows the power of Christ in salvation. Not for the rich young ruler. He didn't want to burn anything. He didn't want to sell anything. He wanted to cling to it. So how can this be? How can one person receive a call from Christ and walk away sad because he would have to give up his wealth, and then another person burn tens of thousands of dollars worth of their possessions and then run fully into Jesus' arms? How could two people have such a drastic response to the call of Christ? And this is what I would say to that. A humble heart, and I emphasize humble, that can embrace the reality of what Jesus is offering you in comparison to what you have in the world will be able to make a choice to accept him. And it is a choice to accept Jesus. And that's why it says in Hebrews 3, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. God's saying, you remember how the Israelites hardened their hearts against me and it made them wander around the wilderness for 40 years suffering in the desert? Don't harden your heart like that. Everybody in here, including myself, we have a choice on how receptive our heart is. We can harden it against God. We can soften it against God. And you don't get to blame the devil. And you don't get to blame your circumstances if it's hard. It's on us. If the rich young ruler can harden his heart and walk away sad, yet all these Ephesians can start burning millions of dollars worth of magic scrolls and stuff, it's a choice. Some were humble, and the rich young ruler was at least not humble enough. A true encounter with Jesus Christ could be and probably will be the most revealing moment in your lifetime. What do you love more? It's either a time to shrink in fear of what you may lose, or a time to fall at his feet in what you might gain. And the gain you find, which is forgiveness, freedom, victory, probably not going to be money. Well, he might hand you a couple bills every now and then to help you out. All of these gains will far outweigh the gain you think you have in the world, that people think they have in the world. So here's my question, because not everybody in here is in love with money. I don't know all of you people personally. A couple of you might have a couple of desires in your heart that just come up every now and then. Even the fear of losing money could be interpreted as a love of money, and I know a lot of us struggle with that, right? We don't know exactly where each other are on this, but it is good to expose the heart. So here's my question. If it's not money, what else is it? It could be something else other than money. It doesn't have to be wealth. I say gold. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty close. Here's my question. What are you walking away from Christ with sadness in your heart today? Because if you fully gave yourself to him, you would lose that thing that you hold so close. It doesn't have to be money. Could be money. Could be relationships. No, you can hang on to Jesus' love. You don't have to let go of that. It could be anything. It, what it, it could just simply be a carefree life that you've decided to live on your terms and not God's. It doesn't have to be something physical. It could be the just simple comfortability of your life, that if you handed your life over to Jesus, you would lose that control and that comfortability. 
I remember sitting in church many times as a middle schooler growing up and would sit there and think, some point I have to, I have to jump on board with this. At some point, I'm going to have to give my life to Jesus. But right now, I have a long list of things that I do not want to give up. I enjoy them too much, and I'm going to enjoy them as long as I can. So one day God says, well, that enjoyment is, is done. So you're not going to enjoy those any longer. But I remember thinking that one day I have to give these up. And I bet all of us could think of one little thing in our lives right now that we're hanging on to just a little bit too much instead of giving it to Jesus. Many people in the world that haven't come to Christ, I think they know deep down, if they're being led by him, that following Christ is actually the correct decision to make if they've been raised in any sort of Christian experience. But the attachment they have to the past and things in this life, they continue to trump that decision over and over and over and over. And for some, they're going to wait too long, and they're going to carry that attachment with them into their grave. Jesus was merciful with me. I could have held on to that list for my, the rest of my life and never actually made the decision to follow him, but he was merciful and patient. And I think this comes down to something very simple. Does your entire life belong to Jesus or not? And this is where it gets a little intimidating, right? Does my whole life really belong to him? Maybe you're here today and you've never offered it to him. If today you're hearing his voice, definitely do not wait. If you have given your life to him today and you've laid it down in the past, but now some parts of your life are starting to belong to you again, we can do that as Christians, right? If you're hearing his voice today, you need to give them back. Does our entire life belong to Jesus or not? We could sit here and make lists about uh, lists of all the different things that we think hang us up. And you could try to work on that one thing and then step up the ladder and work on that next thing and step up the ladder and then try to work on that next thing. Or we could look at that list and say, all of it's gone because my entire life belongs to Jesus. We don't want to get hung up on meticulously trying to dominate hang-ups in our life. Does it all belong to him or not? The reality is Jesus just might require our lives of us one day. What if that's the call for us, is to, is for, to give up your life for Christ? And if your life doesn't fully belong to him now, is it going to fully belong to him then? If you can't give up porn, if you can't give up a love of money, if you can't give up an obsession with any of the things of this world, could you give up your life for Jesus? Would you be ready? Just less than a week ago, a 28-year-old woman who believed herself to be a man embraced the lies that our government and the media and the devil himself tell, pardon if I would do this sometimes, that Christians are hateful bigots and that she was a victim of our tyrannical and genocidal attitude toward people like her. She believed that since she was raised in a Christian school that taught the biblical principles of gender, sexuality, and God's creation order, she was a victim of a hateful system that sought to oppress her as she dove deeper into the confusion of our culture. And in her vengeance, she killed three kids, three adults, including the pastor's nine-year-old daughter. Is this an isolated incident, you could ask yourself? I tend to believe not. Because the moral stances you and I decide to take today as Christians in this society will increasingly make people think that you are the problem. You know, the media might not call it a hate crime, but I will. That's what happened. And I'm not speaking just of violence today. I'm, just, I'm speaking of ridicule, hatred, mocking. If your life is not placed entirely in Jesus' hands, can you be prepared for that type of treatment? And I don't bring this up in order to cause fear and paranoia that violence could strike you at any second. That's not what I'm saying. But I do want to say it to show that giving everything up for Christ might look a little differently than you thought. Giving your life up for Christ might not look like a soldier barging into your room and asking you if you're a Christian and you have to say yes or no. Giving your life up for Christ might look like running to a shooter in your school because you're a Christian school. And that's what the principal of that school did. She died running to stop her. That's what it might look like for your life to be fully placed in Jesus' hands. It's different than we might think. And I know today is Palm Sunday. We're celebrating our king. 
coming into Jerusalem to give up his life. It's a day of celebration. I'm not here to give you messages of sorrow and fear and worry and hatred and, oh my gosh, what's our country coming to? What are we going to do? That's not why I'm here. I would like to send you guys a message of hope that your life can belong so fully to Jesus that even in the most daunting circumstances with the most horrible outcome possible, it can happen in Jesus' care and it can happen for her glory, for his glory, excuse me. When that woman charged that, that, that woman and she, was, and she was taken out trying to protect them from a, from a Christian persecution, that's to God's glory. And I believe all of these outcomes can happen um, with us having that uh, perspective. Here's the question. Is all of this really worth it? The things that you might have to give up, the poor reputation that you might take on, is it really worth it? Is it worth it to stand up for the biblical principles of gender and sexuality that are destroying children's lives today? Is it really worth it to stand up for Jesus and be a different person in my school place and in my workplace and in my home? It's definitely worth it. Mark 10, 28 through 31 says this. Peter began, this is, this is right after the rich young ruler. This is Peter's conversation with, with Jesus. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Peter said, we've given up everything. When that man walked away, he said he, said he walked away sad because he had great possessions. Jesus said, Peter said, we've given up everything. And what was Jesus' response is there's great reward in giving up everything for Jesus. It is worth it. It's always been worth it. And it will always be worth it to lay down everything for Jesus. And it might just be your life one day. Spurgeon said this, and I'll close with this. In the final account, it shall be found that no man has ever been a loser through giving up anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Another paradox in the Christian world that you learn that actually giving up everything for Jesus is when you gain the most for him. Amen? Worship team, please come up. Um, David and Elsie, if you will, be up here for communion. Samuel, if you'll come up here for communion as well. We're going to take communion, and uh, Palm Sunday, Jesus is the last chapter of his life, you could say, as he comes into Jerusalem to give his life for us. And this discussion we're having about the rich young ruler not being able to give up his life for Jesus, he didn't just have to give up his wealth. Jesus was saying he needed to give up everything. As we take communion today, we think of Jesus giving up everything for us. What's that tiny, menial, trivial thing that you haven't given up for him? Do it today. Do it before you take communion, even. So let's take a moment to just pray and thank Jesus for not wanting to cling on to the things that he loved that for our sake, for, for his own sake, but, but actually giving up his life for our sake. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for um, your selflessness and your love that has led us to relationship with you. And as we think about the trials that are facing our personal lives, our cities, towns, country, world, we know, Jesus, that uh, things are unpredictable and things are spiraling out of control very quickly. And for Christians to be prepared for the role that we need to play, we need to be more than just equipped with political views and stances. We need to be equipped with the readiness of the gospel in order to walk in the path that you have for us in tougher days. So thank you for placing your spirit in us who makes all of these things possible. They don't need to be super difficult when we walk closely with you. And as we take communion together, let us remember your sacrifice that uh, truly made all of this possible. And we can look to you with hearts of gratitude and thankfulness knowing, Jesus, that uh, we have been placed in a special position and that we have been called for a time like this to do great things in your name, to bring hope to people, to bring encouragement to suffering people, to suffering brothers and sisters. Um, and as we reflect on the suffering you endured for us, 
we can truly become more effective for you as our eyes are fixed in the right place. As we come forward for communion, give us hearts of humility, ready to lay over the things that we need to. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to take communion. You guys are welcome to come forward at any time. You can come down the center aisle, and we'll take them together when you return. Should I dance on the heights and make my bed among the dust? Mercy waits at the end. Like you planned it from the start Should the dawn come with wings Or find the far side of the sea There your hand still fastens me Pray for the bread. I'll do the juice. After Jesus broke the bread, he took the cup which symbolizes his blood shed for us. And Lord, we can often forget that sacrifice, but right now we intentionally remember it. And we know that it is your blood that washes us clean. Let's remember that now with hearts of thankfulness toward you.
can all stand as we sing our closing song. about him, if we are going to sing about him being our all in all, let's live like it. Amen? Amen. And keep praying for the Whitleys. We'll be looking forward to seeing you with good news when you get back. All right, have a good week, everybody.